During my recent maternity leave, I spent most of my hands-free time trying to figure out why my doctors were trying to give my medical data away to advertisers, even after I opted out. I had two different providers for the duration of my pregnancy because one closed their doors before my baby arrived. At both providers, upon my arrival, the staff would hand me a tablet made by Freesia, a company with a roughly $1.7 billion market cap, to check in. Freesia collects demographic information, with fields including information as sensitive as the number of abortions the patient has had and their social security number. Each time I checked in, a form labeled required in bright red letters sought authorization to share my data. But that label was deceptive and felt intentionally so. That was Alex Rosenblatt reading from her recent first opinion essay. It was titled, I declined to share my medical data with advertisers at my doctor's office. One company claimed otherwise. I'll bring you our conversation after a word from our sponsor. I'm Jesse McQuarters, branded content editor for STAT. Recognizing the breadth and diversity of America's 53 million family caregivers, how can we better know and see these important unsung heroes? Lisa Wilson, Head of Caregiver Advancement Strategy and Experience at United Healthcare, offers insights. Family caregivers are a cornerstone of our health system, but it can be challenging to support them in the moments that matter. United Healthcare is breaking down the barriers to identifying and engaging caregivers. For example, we're making it easy for caregivers to establish necessary HIPAA permissions and encouraging self-identification. The more we know about this population, the more we see them, especially early on in their caregiving journey, the better support we can provide. For more information, visit uhc.com slash caregiving. Welcome to the First Opinion Podcast. I'm Tori Bosch, the new editor of First Opinion. First Opinion is Stats' platform for articles written by biotech insiders, healthcare workers, researchers, and others with interesting or illuminating or provocative perspectives to share about the life sciences writ large. Alex, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Tori. I really appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. So as the excerpt you read from your essay tells us, you often had to fill out a form from a company called Freesia when you checked in at your OBGYN office. You know, it's sort of something that I think the average person, and I'm including myself here, just sort of fills out on on autopilot at the doctor's office. But you have really good reason professionally to read more closely. So what's your background and why did you actually read the things that most of us just click through? Well, I care very deeply about my privacy, and I've had years of being a professional researcher. And so I pay really close attention to the fine print. Uh, at the doctor's office, I think it takes me like 45 minutes longer than anyone else because I sit there reading through every <laughs> single form. Uh, and, I, and I take care to arrive early, <laughs> often to try and get paper copies if I have to, or just to, you know, to pay close attention. And so I noticed that there was this strange form inserted in the workflow of the Freesia tablet asking for my authorization to share my data. And because I've read the privacy policies at all of my doctor's offices over the years, uh, I noticed that this one was a little bit different. It uh, permitted me to continue to see my provider even if I opted out, which is very unusual because normally you do have to sign off on forms that permit the physician's practice to share your data, such as for billing or for their, their clinical practice. And this one said I could opt out, but not until about eight paragraphs in. And that's when I sort of went on this journey to discover that there's a variety of other HIPAA forms you can insert in a workflow to, you know, get authorization for other purposes. So was this sort of the HIPAA form at these practices or were, was it a separate HIPAA form? It's a separate one from the sort of standard practice one that the practice needs for their uh, clinical purposes, for billing. This was a complete add-on. It's like a completely unnecessary form and serves solely the purpose of permitting this company to mine your data to show you targeted ads uh, as part of their business model. So I'm glad you mentioned that because that was my next question, which is, can you tell us a little bit about Freesia and, and 
what, as far as you can tell, they're doing with data that they collect from from patients? That's a great question, because I can't even get a clear, comprehensive answer of what data that I include in my check-in process is then available for use for targeted ads, assuming that the patient authorized them. I've asked my providers, I've asked Freesia through myself, I've asked through a dummy account, I've asked their sales staff, <laughs> and I can't seem to get a, a comprehensive, complete list of data that is used. Uh, from my provider, it seemed like it was mainly demographic information that could include uh, your age, your birth, your your sex, uh, etc. But they do have an obligation to share a minimum amount of data as necessary to support their clinical operations. And so I was a bit surprised to learn that when I asked Frisia directly, the answer I, I received included, for example, a list of medications and diagnoses. And so it's it's really challenging because, you know, an average patient is not going to have the time, the wherewithal, maybe even the interest <laughs> to try and find a comprehensive real answer. And I found that I've had like three separate and complete answers just from asking the people who should know, which are my providers and Frisia itself. So, yeah, let's back up a second and maybe just take us along on the journey. So you start being handed these tablets when you check in. What are you doing and how does this sort of journey follow you through the course of your pregnancy and then after the birth of your child? Uh, well, I was handed the tablet, of course, every time I checked in. So you go for a, a number of, of routine checkups when you're pregnant and you have to sort of make these regular visits. You have to check in each time with this tablet. And I opted out and I just I just had this feeling, you know, like I better keep a record of this because at no point was I ever emailed a confirmation about what my answer was, which is kind of unusual, right? Like how hard is it to get an emailed copy of what you've signed anywhere? We're so accustomed to using DocuSign or to sort of like facilitating contractual agreements over the internet in a post-COVID era that merely obtaining a copy of what you signed shouldn't be an uphill battle. <laughs> and yet it wasn't it wasn't available. So I, I took photos and I sometimes recorded myself filling out the tablet just to be able to have a, a copy. Um, my providers ended up closing uh, before my pregnancy was complete. And so I was um, in a bit of a scramble actually looking for a, a new a new uh, OBGYN practice and my the one from my from my original practice referred me onwards to a really a really wonderful group of doctors, and of course I get there and they hand me the tablet. I'm going, oh no, like here we go again. <laughs> but I fill it out. It's a bit of an onerous process to have to fill it out each time, and even the fact that you encounter this authorization form every single time is a little odd. You know, why do you have to ask me for my consent every time I come? Why not? You know, once every couple of years, or I think they're trying to implement the practice now actually of once a year. But like, what you have so many opportunities to lose control over your data through absolutely routine care, routine checkups. And I feel strongly that the onus should be the opposite. It should be hard to lose privacy for your reproductive data. And it's not. It's just so easy to lose it. So, you know, you're filling in this form every time you go to the doctor's office. And then if I'm remembering correctly, at some point you decided you needed to check in with Freesia to see what they had. So what happened when you reached out to Freesia? Well, I'd read an article uh, by Jeffrey Fowler at the Washington Post uh, a couple of months earlier, and it just sort of rattled around in my brain for a while that, you know, there was this form, people were aware of it, but the article didn't didn't sort of dig into what happens when you opt out. And just as a note of precaution, I had these sort of researcher instincts. I just wrote their privacy inbox to check that they never had any authorization on file. And I was shocked when they wrote back and simply offered to revoke my authorization. I'm going like, I've made all these efforts. I just, you know, showed up 45 minutes early to every single one of my appointments so I could, you know, opt out of this one form. And you're telling me you have an authorization on file. And I'm going like, did I miss something? You know, I was in pain for part of that pregnancy. I have a toddler. I had a full-time job. I'm like busy and distracted and I'm trying to manage so many things. Like, did I, did I accidentally authorize this? Uh, and so I asked them just for a copy of the form where I authorized it and nothing, you know, they won't give me one. And I'm going like, they, I'm going back and forth with them. They say, all we can do is, is revoke your authorization. And this entire time, I'm just asking for it to substantiate their the claim. Um, I say, okay, please go ahead and revoke what you have. You know, errors happen. Maybe someone who checked me in accidentally signed me up. You know, I don't know. Uh, 
but please also provide me with, with proof. And they write me back on the day I give birth. And they say, now that we've revoked your authorization, we no longer have the original copy on file. And I'm stunned. What kind of records management is that? How could you claim to take patient consent seriously if you can't even maintain accurate records of who's opted in, who's opted out, where the forms have gone? Like, did, did, did you delete it? You know, <laughs> I can't imagine that a surgeon who operates on you finishes the operation and goes to the consent form and tears it up and says, who needs permission anymore? You know, <laughs> I know they gave it to me. <laughs> so they, they, they won't provide one. And at this point, uh, they advise me that if I want copies of anything, I have to go through my providers bearing in mind that one of them has since closed their doors. So I have to find out the company that acquired them. I have to go up the chain of privacy commanders and privacy researchers to figure out you know, someone just who knows what I'm talking about. And I spent like a month in the wrong direction. Because I'm not an expert in this area, I went through medical records. And so I just asked for copies of all of my medical records, which is, by the way, not where they store this form, including a number of your medical details. They store it in like patient administrative services. So you have to find some other person at this company who understands that, that a company was acquired that used this particular vendor <laughs> that has a record of this form somewhere. And so you're like 14 calls in. There are so many opportunities at which you're made to feel rude for trespassing on the orderly conduct of the day. You're upsetting a status quo of how arrangements are made. And so by asking for what you're entitled to, which is an accurate copy of your record, uh, and asking for information about why your records have been misappropriated, why the consent was inaccurately logged, you know, you're, you're treated as someone who's a bit aggressive and also just being inhospitable, <laughs> you know, towards your hosts. And the, the types of responses I would receive uh, sort of as I got more senior would be something like, you know, so-and-so has already done so much work to answer your questions. You know, is that not enough for you? And I'm going like, I understand what you did there, but <laughs> at the end of the day, it's your responsibility to make sure that my personal health information is appropriately handled. I'm revealing that it was not, you know, why am I the bad person here? Right. I mean, this gets to that idea that's really sort of popular, right, that if, if you're not paying for something, you're not the customer, you're the product. And this is a real example of you were the product, right? They didn't really want to provide any sort of customer service to you. They didn't. And and to be fair, perhaps they're not used to being, or at least Frisia is not used to being patient facing because they operate as, you know, a business associate to all of these other <laughs> uh, businesses, like they're a B2B vendor. But they functionally are very patient facing. It's the first thing you see at the digital front door to your doctor's office. And, and your only opportunity to... Uh, uh, like find accountability is to email their their privacy inbox. So, you know, they're, they're creating these pathways uh, for patients to interface with them, but they're not really set up to provide, you know, a proper record. So what was the final verdict? You know, did you ever find the missing authorization form? Regia wouldn't even tell me the date at which they supposedly received authorization. So it's not like I could just go to one provider and say, hey, could you pull up this consent form from March 16th, 2022. It was, you're going on a fishing expedition to get the documents from every single visit you've had with any provider to try and find an errant one that supposedly has a positive authorization for Frisia to use my data for targeted advertising. Uh, so I have to go through not only my current practice, but the company Optum, which acquired you know my former practice. And ultimately, there are director of privacy, who I reached a couple of months later, uh, asked Frisia for an explanation. And at that point, uh, things started to move much more quickly than they had in the previous you know, two months or so. Uh, they discovered that they had no authorization uh, on file, that, and they offered a very interesting explanation. They said that their systems were basically confused or tripped up um, by the fact that I was manually checked in by the admin staff on one occasion. Which means that even if you try to never engage with this form anytime, if you just said, I'm never using this tablet, you know, you're still at risk <laughs> of, of their systems, you know, perhaps opting you in or otherwise sort of mismanaging the consent record on the file. But then a couple of weeks later, I, I took a look at what they wrote to a second provider where they provided an actual date of when this supposed confusion began. And it was about six weeks after they told me that they revoked the, uh, the errant authorization they had on file. 
So something still to this day doesn't add up. Um, I don't know exactly what's gone wrong, but it's clear to me that it's not working properly. And I wonder why this isn't more concerning to the customers of this particular vendor. You know, Optum and many others have a very strong interest in protecting patient privacy. How can they be so reliant on a vendor for patient intake services that is demonstrably poor at managing patient consent? Yeah, I mean, one thing that really sticks out to me about this is just how unprepared everybody down the line was to help you on this journey. And I think that shows how few patients actually want to engage with this. And, you know, seeing what you went through shows why no one wants to, right? I mean, you know, we you show up 45 minutes early for doctor's appointments. You made dozens of phone calls. You dealt with people who were being, you know, kind of condescending and rude, suggesting that you had already wasted people's time. This is not something that most people want to do. The system is sort of set up to keep you in some ways from trying to pursue this information. I mean, I guess one question I have is, do you, what made you decide that this quest was worth your limited energy as you're dealing with a newborn and a toddler and a job and, and just life? I think I was just very deeply offended that my privacy could be so easily violated. Uh, and that's it. It was <laughs> it was a moral outrage that inspired me to use my extremely limited hands-free time <laughs> away from my newborn and sort of like <laughs> away from my toddler and, and everything else uh, to pursue this. And in the end, you know, I'm glad that I did because I hope that this will bring about changes to their business practices. I have larger hopes that there will be regulatory action. For example, the Federal Trade Commission is interested in simply banning (laughs) outright the sharing or selling of health data to advertisers. And at the end of the day, you know, like what advantages do patients really accrue from having their data mined for advertising? Like it's possible that you hear about some cure or some drug that it turns out to be a game changer for you. But I would be willing to bet that in the vast majority of cases, your provider or your specialist is equipped to make that recommendation to you outside of any assist from advertisers. And I really question why patients have to be vulnerable to that kind of extractive process in accessing routine care. It's not what they're signing up for, and yet it's what they're getting. And as you put it, it's a point of real friction if you try to opt out or even confirm your opt out. <laughs> you know, it's a three month journey. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And, you know, and it is also just as you sort of gesture toward here, one piece of this healthcare data ecosystem. So, I mean, where are the other places in which our healthcare data might be collected that we aren't even thinking about or that we just click accept on without thinking? I think that there's a well there's the question of whether the you know what you're using is in fact a HIPAA covered entity uh, in a lot of cases just using a health or a wellness tracker or something like that would not subject you to the protections that HIPAA could provide that's it's pretty limited in that respect but we've seen that there's been a sort of merging of an app space and a clinical space in which the protections are unclear when you're simply navigating a hospital website perhaps clicking on you know the the needs that you have, you're looking for cancer care, you're looking for reproductive care, all that information could be tracked and monitored and sent over to Facebook or Meta or Google, uh, you know, without you being aware of it. And so there's this real question of what is the ethical responsibility of the provider to ensure that you're aware, for example, that you know, before you enter the door, <laughs> everything you do on this website is is vulnerable to uh, advertising tracking. And when it's and when the door is closed, like when you're with your provider, you know, are you protected? And that it could be mostly true. But what if when you're in the you know the digital waiting area to see them, you accidentally click on a form like the one I encountered, which makes your diagnoses, your medication list, you know, available to. Uh, to be used for targeted advertising as well. And so I think there's this been this real creep, you know, as as devices that are digital have entered into this clinical space. And it's not to say that, you know, data that you provide couldn't be used for research for for really good purposes that people might very willingly sign up for, but there's a complete absence of affirmative consent in those processes. You know, when you start to try and navigate a, a hospital website, you're not thinking I really would like to opt out of someone sending my data to Facebook right now. You know, it's just like the last thing from your mind because what you're seeking is care. But what you're getting is this entitlement to something that you might not willingly give, but you're being coerced into giving up. 
And it does seem notable that this is sort of happening at the intersection of these other forces, right, which is that healthcare providers are majorly overstretched, right? I mean, if you don't want to check in on the Freesia tablet, that makes life harder for the administrator at your practice, as you mentioned. Um, You also mentioned that your first doctor's office closed because it was acquired by a giant company. That's something that is happening to a lot of practices. A giant company, in this case, actually ended up being helpful because they knew exactly who to reach out to at Freesia. But generally, it seems that these forces of sort of consolidation within healthcare, overstretched healthcare workers, make it a lot easier for these companies to sort of come in and pitch their wares saying, we're going to make this easier for you. So, you know, why don't you just give us access to your patients? Right. And it's not that, you you know, clinics shouldn't adopt patient intake software that makes it more efficient for them to manage the inflow. I'm totally sympathetic to that. Like, I hope people use technology to create better efficiencies in how patients are seen and how uh, providers can provide care. But at what point can you negotiate back and say, yes, we're willing to pay for this patient intake software, but no, you're not allowed to use it as an opportunity to obtain a passive consent from people people who are rushedly or hurriedly reading through their forms, they can actually get to their doctor. You know, why is it a hidden loop? And then why is it so difficult to have proof of consent? You know, it's just, it seems absolutely designed to passively obtain your unwitting consent. Um, And the fact that I very wittingly did not (laughs) provide consent and was still vulnerable to all the same sort of trajectories of that data uh, really proves the point, right? It's not enough to be a, an incredibly informed or insistent or persistent, you know, manager of your data data privacy. And you shouldn't have to be, you know, you should, you absolutely shouldn't have to. The default should be uh, the other way around. It should be difficult to give away your consent. Yeah. You know, so you mentioned that uh, the Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. is thinking about a proposal that would make it not allowed to share certain kinds of health data. You know, do you have a sense that that is something that could actually happen? Or does it feel maybe a little bit like a like a privacy pipe dream? I think it's possible, but I think their targets seem to be at this gray zone where something that maybe isn't totally covered by HIPAA, you know, provides your data uh, over to advertisers. Uh, it could be that they have bigger intentions to prevent outright the sharing or selling of, of health data to advertisers in any situation. Um, I, I don't think it's a pipe dream. But I think that what my story shows is that simply using consent as a as a Band-Aid solution, like if we just obtain consent, everyone's cool, right? <laughs> no problems. And that's been the sort of retort to privacy advocacy for a really long time. As long as we have consent, then we're good to go. But if that consent is sort of de- obtained through deceptive forms that are labeled required when they're not actually required, you know, or when they don't really respect your your opt-out, you know, it, it sort of proves a lie that it's, not, it's really not enough and that there should be a, a greater force of protection to support patients and consumers when it comes to their health data. And we know that even if people are uncomfortable with privacy harms, they're still going to accept them in order to access services that they need. It makes total sense, but it doesn't mean they should have to suffer the discomfort. Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, you mentioned uh, privacy harms. What are some of the harms here? I mean, I guess intellectually, right, it just feels uncomfortable, you know, knowing that a company out there might know that you have had an abortion um, or that you've taken certain medications. But what are the actual harms of that, you know, from a, a privacy advocate perspective? It's a great question because I spoke to some law professors about this, sort of seeking a legal theory of privacy harm to try and encapsulate what I was experiencing because I knew that there was an injury, but it was intangible, right? Like most, the problem with pursuing sort of privacy justice in general is that harm is a is a concept in American law that is associated with a dollar amount. You know, was your house damaged? <laughs> you know, did you lose a limb? Like these are things you can describe a monetary value of, of injury to. And privacy is, is diffuse and intangible. But I I read an article on risk and anxiety by legal scholars Daniel Solov and Danielle Citron that tried to convey a, a theory of harm that was based on the anxiety you experience at it and feeling at risk of future injury. Like, you don't really know what happens when a history of, of abortion or anything else circulates, you know, about you in ways that are beyond your control. But you do have this nagging sense that anything that can be stigmatized will be used against you. And they, they use the example of people whose uh, 
credit was potentially damaged by people who stole their identities or, or who suffered a data breach, right? And when you suffer, a, if you get a notification that, you know, so in, this company like experienced a data breach and your, your personal data was affected, you don't really know what to do, right? Like you're kind of like, well, <laughs> I guess I'll try and monitor my credit a little more. You know, you don't really know. And yet you have this nagging sense of anticipatory harm from the fact that you did experience something that made you vulnerable to all sorts of threats. And so they set the example of people who uh, declined to pursue employment opportunities or declined to get try and get a mortgage because they're worried that their credit score or credit history has been marred by some fraudulent use of their identity. And I think that that there's a parallel there between that and what patients experience in trying to seek out care. You know, you're not going to not go to your doctor. You know, you're <laughs> I'm like, you know, let's say I'm eight months pregnant. I'm not going to be like, nope, it's time to you know quit my OBGYN because I have like a privacy concern. It's just it's ridiculous in the order of priority sequence. But uh, it doesn't mean you didn't I didn't experience any harm. You know, it was the the feeling of, of powerlessness at your doctor's office, uh, which women in general sort of experience more broadly because their pain often isn't uh, recognized. And privacy harm is a little bit like that. It's not a physical pain. It's intangible. And yet, you know, I, you're experiencing it, it. And then you don't know where your data has gone. And you don't know in what ways your medical history might be used to stigmatize you in some in some way. You just have this greater fear of the unknown and you worry that, you know, this sensitive information might, once it's in other hands, harm you in some way. And I think that's the legal theoretical direction to, to lean on here, is that the anticipatory anxiety of future injury is valid as a harm, and it doesn't have to be immediate for you to have experienced a consequence. So what do you want the average reader or listener to take from this? I mean, should I be taking a, a photo of every consent form at my doctor's going forward? You know, what do you think is reasonable precautions for the average person to be taking going forward while we hope that some change might happen on, you know, a, a regulatory level? That's a great question because there's like privacy people and there's everybody else. <laughs> um, the, the, the very privacy sensitive uh, may try and take a photo of every form, but honestly, even that's a, a crazy onus, right? Like, let's say you go to your pediatrician with this new child and they're screaming, you know, or they're hungry. And you're not going to be, you're not going to have the wherewithal to sit there and try and opt out of a form. But I think it would be reasonable to address it with your provider as, hey, this is just something I'm not very comfortable with. Do you have an alternative? You know, could I manually check in? Um, ironically, when I did manually check in, that was like, Apparently, Frisia said that that was the source of their confusion about whether or not I provided consent. And so I don't think that's even a clear solution, but it's something. You know, it's and it's not it's not a solution that's easily advertised at the office because, of course, the administrators want you to use their check in software to save them the burden of checking you in. But it's one it's one solution you can take. You can raise it as a, you know, very politely with your with your physician as something that this like you know makes you uncomfortable and they have the power to bring it up with the folks who run their clinics right who like your doctor is your doctor but they're associated with a practice <laughs> that hires people to manage patient services and they could bring it up with their vendor and say hey could you nix this form from the check-in process or could we change the way it's designed could you take away the word required on it so patients don't think that it's uh in fact, required when it's not. And so I think there's a, a low level of advocacy anyone is capable of if they raise the issue with their physicians. Um, I don't have strong hopes that this is like a, a popular appeals process that will take action. But I think that there is some hope that regulators from the FTC to Health and Human Services uh, could enact new rules and policies that simply that simply change course and say the doctor's office is no place for ad tech. Oh, well, that sounds like uh, a dream that I can get behind, too, for sure. Um, Alex Rosenblatt, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Tori. I really appreciate it. And thank you for listening to the First Opinion podcast. It's produced by Teresa Gaffney. Alyssa Ambrose is the senior producer, and Rick Burke is the executive producer. I love to hear from listeners, so let me know which First Opinion contributors you'd like to hear on the show or what topics the podcast should take on. You can do that by sending an email to first.opinion at statnews.com. And if you have a minute, please leave a review or rating on whichever platform you use to get your podcasts. Thank you so much for joining us, and someday I will have a good sign-off for this show. <laughs>